runs competitively and he has been running for all, competitively for almost four decades. He's also been awarded uh, the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians Teacher of the Year. Welcome, Mark, and thank you so much for your contribution. A pleasure to be here, a privilege. I've learned so much from the group and keep learning, so. Thank you so much. Um, and obviously Mark doesn't need any introduction, but for any of you who are new and joining us for the first time, this textbook is, is for everybody. Uh, another person who needs no introduction is Dr. Rob Sivers. Dr. Rob Sivers specializes in weight management and bariatric surgery for adults and adolescents in West Palm Beach, Florida. He's been doing bariatric surgery for 18 years, performing over 8,000 surgeries his training began in Cape Town, South Africa, where he got his medical degree from the University of Cape Town and then went on to earn his PhD in liver carbohydrate metabolism. Um, and Dr. Sivers' research led to a comprehensive understanding of the toxicity of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption as the primary cause of obesity. He's developed a practice uh, he's developed the practice into an internationally recognized center of excellence for, barrier, for obesity surgery. And he helps patients manage their obesity. Um, he addresses carbohydrate addiction along with bariatric surgery, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. He's also an international lecturer. And uh, his contribution to the textbook is as well fantastic. Thank you so much, Rob, for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate that, Hasina. One thing just to uh, update a little bit is that I, I would like to shed the bariatric surgery title because that's something I do occasionally. But more and more, uh, I'm focused on metabolic health and creating metabolic health as a specialty. Mark and I both practice in the space and really promoting the fact that um, treating metabolic health covers a variety of different diseases, some that may require surgery, others that do not. And so it really is applying tools appropriately and bariatric surgery should just be a tool rather than being something that applies to everybody. So that's a large part of the transformation that came out of my roots as bariatric surgery, but metabolic health is the new watchword and this ketogenic textbook is the foundation of that. And Thanks so much for saying that. Started our own society that, you know, Rob and myself were part of Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. So if you're a clinician, you know, RD, doctor, nurse practitioner, you can actually go through our curriculum, which includes a lot of Robert's work and get certified in metabolic health. You know, there's subspecialties of, I think there's about 200 subspecialties now, Rob. I think, you know, when I was in med school, there were about 20 or 30, but now the, the field, you know, is blooming. So we want to have our own little niche and it's not just uh, obesity. This is metabolic at, at a root. You know, obesity would be just one of the branches of that problem. So check us out uh, online, Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. You could just search that and we have a web page. Uh, we have clinical guidelines on there and how to certify. Thanks so much. You know, I think for us who know you in the space, um, we know what you do um, and mentioning things like bariatric surgery. Rob, you know, since you, you spoke about that, for people who are considering bariatric surgery or who know what bariatric surgery is, can you tell us briefly how therapeutic carbohydrate restriction has impacted your practice and taking it away, leaning away from bariatric surgery towards nutritional-based uh, and other therapies? Yeah, I think uh, if I can just have a, a short platform here, what we're talking about is weight loss versus weight loss maintenance. And if you look at three, by far the three commonest practice modalities in the weight loss space, diet is number one. And all diet is ultimately based upon a concept of caloric reduction. Uh, eat less, do more. So even, even ketogenic diets are still a form of caloric reduction. The second methodology that I know Mark will talk a lot about or is very into is the medications. And right now in America, um, they're pouring GLP-1. I, th I think if you turn on the tap in America, Ozempic comes out of the tap. Everybody is on Ozempic. And it's being used and abused it has definitely got a place in weight management. And then the second, the third part is bariatric surgery or devices 
whether it's a balloon, whether it's a surgery, all three of which are designed primarily, or the people use it for caloric reduction, and everybody loses weight. The problem is 100% of those, if used as an exclusive methodology, and I'm using the word 100%, they fail because people do not understand why they gained the weight in the first place. And unless you make a transformation in the root cause of their obesity, for example, if you use diabetic medication, nobody ever cures their, or puts their type 2 diabetes into remission using medication. You control the numbers, but you're still diabetic. And ultimately, TCR, or therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, uh, addressing your relationship with sugar and starch and modifying that relationship as it pertains to uh, a, a larger fraction of nutrition in your nutritional day. And as it also crosses over into the mental health space, where you're eating more and more for the emotional value of carbohydrates and the emotional value of a snack. Unless you change that behavior, none of those other methodologies are going to work. And I think while we, we started out in the low-carb, high fat space to suppress appetite, which is what all these other, other methodologies do. Ultimately, what it's not about is suppressing appetite and reducing caloric consumption. What it is about is changing insulin resistance toward insulin sensitivity, which is the holy grail of everything that we do. None of those modalities effectively do that completely. So we've got to put them into place. Those are all tools that we use to change our behavior and our relationship with carbohydrates whether it's LCHF as a diet, whether it is or keto as a diet, whether it is medications or whether it is bariatric surgery. And in our practice, we and the, the most important word to my mind is something called multimodal therapy, where you're using a variety of different tools that are appropriate for you to make sure that you get rid of the disease itself, but also address the cause. And more and more, we have to individualize multimodal therapy. In other words, if you go to see your doctor now, they try to plug you into their algorithm. They don't look at you as an individual because they don't have the time to do so. And so they therefore have a, a list of medications they prescribe for this condition. And it's called best practices. And we plug those people into that without ever knowing who is this person genetically, how are they behaviorally, and really individualizing therapy using a variety of tools. So whether it's bariatric surgery, whether it's GLP-1 agonists, other diabetic medications, whether it's TCR, modifying that to the person is what is the next frontier going back toward individualized healthcare. Thanks so much. So Rob, um, you write about body weight regulation very beautifully. You write about the liver, the anatomy, the normal physiology and the pathophysiology. And you write a lot about this new epidemic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mark, you write about beautifully and such a lovely practical guide to the healthcare provider about how to adapt medication for type 2 diabetes. Now, the first thing I want to bring up is that I, as a specialist physician, never had training at all, never was taught, it was never recognized that diabetes is reversible at all. I don't know if it is done. I, I don't think it's done yet at all, but this is at tertiary level. So for many people watching, either they have a family member who has diabetes or they have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. For us, as clinicians treating patients, we've had people go through our hands who've reversed their diabetes. So I want to highlight the fact, and I'm going to start with you, Rob, that this um, epidemic, this pandemic of obesity and the associated with insulin, um, uh, insulin resistance at the core of it and chronic inflammation from so many different um, angles adding to the insulin resistance. Can you speak to the person listening who doesn't believe yet that this disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is reversible? And then I'm going to go on to Mark, because if Mark's writing and has experience in de-prescribing medication, there's evidence there that we are able to reverse these conditions that people are dying today from the horrible complications of these diseases. So I'll start with you, Rob. How can you convince the people listening um, by going into the pathophysiology, the normal, uh, just touching on the normal 
um, anatomy of the liver, what we do wrong and how therapeutic carbohydrate restriction can actually help and does help reverse um, the illness. Absolutely. So understanding the liver as the center of the regulatory system of metabolism is so important. The liver sits at the apex of the GI tract. And except for long chain fatty acids, all the nutrients we eat run directly up one vessel to, to, called the portal vein, including insulin, including all the hormones that are secreted into the blood system by the pancreas. All of those go initially to the liver. And the liver has a job, but also gets injured by the same element. So we can look at the liver both in terms of the job it, fun it does and also um, how it gets injured. The, in terms of how the liver functions, the liver's obligation is to take those individual molecules, amino acids, which are the breakdown product of protein. It doesn't matter if you eat a steak or if you eat some beans. What enters your a portal venous system are amino acids. It doesn't matter if you eat ice cream or um, some pasta. It's glucose and fructose that enters your, your blood system and goes to the liver, and the liver reformats that. So, for example, under the influence of insulin, it builds proteins. Um, the liver will store some of the sugar and release some of the sugar to the bloodstream. So it regulates that. It clears a lot of the fructose and releases glucose into the bloodstream. So the liver is at the apex of metabolism and regulates in large part what enters the blood vessel, vessel system and also what comes from the body to the liver to be remanufactured. As such, the liver is a core place where we produce fat. And if you understand that sugar uh, or glucose in any body space is toxic to that body space, the liver's primary job under the influence of insulin, uh, although it's insulin, insulin doesn't influence the uptake of sugar by the liver, insulin has a regulatory role. Um, the liver turns excess sugar beyond what it's stored as glycogen into fat. And that's the triglycerides we measure in our bloodstream are primarily triglycerides that are formed in the liver um, by, uh, uh, from sugar. And when the sugar comes from protein in your mouth, it's the same triglycerides. And then we use a molecule called VLDL, which the liver produces to go to the fat cells, to transport those triglycerides to the fat cells. And then that VLDL becomes LDL. That's a different, different topic. However, the rate limiting step of the liver to produce and export fat out of the liver is the building of VLDL. So if there's a mismatch between the amount of sugar coming in and the rate of transport of VLDL, now the liver is turning all that sugar into triglycerides, which is very fast. But those triglycerides get trapped in the liver cells because they can't be transported out fast enough. But the primary source of early weight gain is production by the liver and then transport to the fat cells. And the reason I say that, the fat cells themselves can make um, can turn sugar into fat. Those are the two places we create fat. However, um, that happens when you become hyperglycemic. At first, weight storage is primarily governed by the liver. Now, when you are turning sugar into liver, the liver protects the bloodstream of excess blood sugar. And that's very important to understand um, because at first, when we're eating a lot of sugar and starch, the liver becomes fatty and then the liver is creating obesity. So that's the obesogenic pathway. However, at a crucial time, you cannot produce enough insulin to keep manufacturing and turning that uh, sugar into fat, even though the liver doesn't require insulin for the uptake of sugar. And then that extra sugar starts spilling over into the blood vessel space. If the fat cells can't make turn that sugar into fat, now our blood sugar starts to rise. And so fatty liver disease, at first NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's not really a disease, but it's an observation. When we take a biopsy of the liver and we look at those fats at the liver cells, you can actually see storage droplets of fat in the liver. That's the liver doing its job. However, there's a transition point where the sugar concentration in the bloodstream of the liver is so high, it starts to damage the blood vessels in the liver. And now we see inflammation of those blood vessels. That was my PhD. In my PhD, we flooded the liver with excess sugar using an insulin clamp, and we actually cause damage to the blood vessels in the liver. And when you start to damage the blood vessels in the liver, that is the first indicator of diabetic damage. That's diabetes. Diabetes is a blood vascular disorder, and it also gets into the interstitial space of the liver. So now we start getting inflammation. So we've got fatty liver, 
which is the liver just doing its job excessively. And then we add in a second element of inflammation. And that inflammation is crucial because it starts to plug up and damage the blood flow through the liver. And as the liver starts to get less flow of nutrients, it's less able to do its blood, its work. And that inflammation is now called hepatic steatosis or hepa uh, uh, inflammation of the liver or hepatosteatitis. So we're getting inflammation, which is really the damage to the liver. But fatty liver disease, it's not a disease. That's a normal process of the liver eating a lot of carbohydrates. So when you've got early fatty liver disease and you eliminate carbohydrates from your, from your diet, you can correct fatty liver disease in a week. How do I know that? Because as a surgeon, we can biopsy the liver and look at the clearance when a patient is being off carbohydrates for a week. However, the inflammatory component, the hepatitis, the inflammation of the blood vessels, that, uh, that effect lasts much longer and at a certain threshold becomes permanent when you get fibrosis and then cirrhosis in the liver. And that currently is the commonest cause of uh, liver damage, but it's a diabetic injury to the vessels of the liver as opposed to just fat in the, in the liver cells. And it's important to be able to make that distinction. And I know Mark is going to talk about the damage that sugar does to the blood vessels, which over time we call diabetes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. Um, you know, and and the I've got experience working in the liver unit um, at the, our local tertiary level hospital, and you know, just random a patient going in for an ultrasound of something random, and a, a random finding is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Let's say you send the patient in for a renal um, ultrasound, they will you know, it's not uncommon to have a report that there is also evidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So with this beautiful um, explanation you've given of the pathophysiology, one would assume that the first step would be to talk to the patient about carbohydrate restriction, but that is not done. So my well, I, think, I think, let me stop you for a second. The biggest, the first issue with providers is they have to understand that the fat is not the problem. But if you, if you biopsy that liver, if you ultrasound that liver, all you're seeing is fat. If you look at the liver at surgery, you see a fat in the liver. So it's very easy, just like we do with cardiovascular disease, to assume that the fat is the injurious molecule. And we see that with plaque in the blood vessels, we see the same in the liver. You've got to be able to work backward from observation to pathophysiology. Once you understand the physiology by which the liver works, this is the liver creating that fat out of sugar, then you can actually uh, apply a, a, an appropriate remedy. If you believe fat is the problem, you're gonna go down the pathway of fat restriction. So fat diet, and that's exactly that's right. what happens at the moment. The immediate kind of knee-jerk response to every single patient who comes in with, with you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases go to see the dietitian. The doctor isn't even taught um, what the problem is. And what does the dietitian prescribe? The dietitian prescribes a diet that is low in fat, contains grains and doesn't target anything, you know, seed oils and all of that. So Mark, I want to come to you because you've also uh, contributed to the chapter on type 2 diabetes, um, you know, to, to carry on from what Rob's spoken about, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, obviously, we know that the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is being made way too late. So for somebody who's new to this, for a doctor who's interested in a preventative therapy or early, um, you know, uh, nutritional-based therapy, how can you explain the progression um, and, and where should we be starting to diagnose these patients? And then where does therapy, a uh, nutrition-based therapy come in? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a big question, but I, I think I'll tag on to, you know, what, what Robert was talking about. I think David, uh, Dr. David Unwin points at the silent scream of the liver, you know, because people don't feel it. And actually within the gastroenterology circles now, you know, as, as you and Robert were saying, if I'm a parent and I'm told my child has fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because they're 10 and they're not drinking you know, father's bourbon yet, you know, they think as well as because my child is fat, you know, or it's because they're eating fat, you know, they kind of blame it on, well, they're obese, they have the fatty liver when the opposite's true, because they develop the fatty liver first, but 
you know, I think that the modern term now is actually called MAFLD, metabolically associated fatty liver disease, which I think if that makes it into medical school, when people learn about fatty liver, and then they can go back to the root cause. Well, what is MAFLD, metabolically associated fatty liver disease, which is exactly you know, what Rob describes, you know, in, in his work and his PhD. So it's not about, you know, you're eating a carnivorous diet. It's about mostly the fructose is probably the, you know, the, the biggest culprits. And um, yeah, so it really does start, we're doing a pediatric trial now. We're almost a year in and these children, you know, even before pre-diabetes, you know, they've got insulin levels off the rails and they have, they already know they have fatty liver disease. Some of the kids have even had fibro scans. I'd be curious to see, you know, what Robert's thought is on just, uh, you know, if we just screened children with a fibro scan, which is a non-invasive liver scan that shows some of those early changes, you know, and they have elevated uh, transaminases. We had one child who's uh, the transaminases for those listening. These are markers of liver inflammation. So we had a 15 year old when they enrolled in the trial and the transaminases were in the two to 300 range where normal would be about 20. And four months into the uh, lifestyle change, and it's hard for a 15 year old who goes to school and they feed the child the toxins. Imagine if your child went to school and we had uh, poisonous water, uh, tobacco machines, you know, and uh, you allowed firearms to come into the school, right? We would protect the child. You know, you'd think, okay, we need to make a safe environment um, for this child. But we allow probably the biggest toxin for children now, you know, it's hiding in plain sight and we're pushing it on children. So children in our schools in America who are on free school breakfast and lunch, which is basically my whole county here in a rural uh, poor state, West Virginia, they're getting 200 grams of simple carbohydrates at free breakfast and free lunch combined. You know, and if you're a kindergarten child, there's no way you're going to, and then they go home to pizza and Mountain Dew. So, so we're inflicting this in the children, you know, so we're, we're poisoning the liver first, you know, with uh, uh, sweetened milks, uh, juice, uh, sweetened yogurts, cocoa puffs, you know, they're getting all this in free school lunch because the box says whole grain, they're not allowed to have a whole milk because that has fat. So they give them skim milk and they add sugar. And, and I think any scientist would agree that that's absolute lunacy, but yet our school policies aren't driven by medical guidance. They're driven by policy of the USDA, which is an agriculture arm. So, so we have, you know, a, a group of a political group or that has nothing to do with health. They have to do with agriculture feeding children. And so it's a mismatch. So I think if you're a parent, you have to realize what's happening and it's not your fault. So if your child has this condition, it's, it's really not your fault. But yeah, it really does. I think if we had a way to early screen People want objective markers, you know, and Rob and I can look across the room and we know a child has fatty liver because they're carrying weight in the belly, you know, but I think parents are like, oh, they're just as everyone in my family looks like this. The doc, the last doctor said they're healthy, they're not diabetic yet, or their cholesterol is okay, but no, they are becoming diabetic if we were to actually draw an insulin level on that child, you know, which, which uh, we're seeing insulin levels you know, that are just off the, off the rails, you know, up into the 80s to 90 range where normal would be less than 10. These are fasting insulin. You know, in that child I mentioned, so, it, you know, the transaminases in four months went down to about 30, you know, so yeah. went from like two to 300 range down to 30. And that child hadn't lost a lot of weight yet. It lost maybe five to 10 pounds uh, off of a 300 pound body size. You know, so it was a bit frustrated. So this child was frustrated. Oh, you know, the weight's not coming off yet, but this child was so, so far into insulin resistance. You know, it takes a long time to get the insulin low down, but, you know, so we gave that child some love and said, look, and, I, and the child's still doing well, your liver is unpacking and we got to unpack the liver first before you're really going to lose the weight. And that child's uh, suitcase was fully stuffed, you know, so that child's liver at a transamination of 300 and the child had had all of the liver specialist tests so they they didn't know why the liver you know hepatitis tests all the different weird stuff we learned in med school they were all negative but it was a food induced uh problem so yeah catching it early with other markers than your traditional markers if you're a parent you know an insulin level looking at the liver enzymes and even considering one of these non-invasive um 
liver screens. Are you using, Rob, are you using uh, fiber scans at all, or do you see any early utility in that in children? No, I don't. I, I think that the fiber scan gives you an answer, but it doesn't give you a response. So I can do blood work. I can look at the ALKFAS. I can look at the AST and the ALT, which are markers of injury to the liver. But as you said, the most important test for these kids is their C-peptide, their insulin levels, their A1Cs, their blood sugars. The diabetic metrics are far, far more important, especially since these kids are not, and we're talking about children now, but even in adults. Once you have that, I don't like the word diabetes. I prefer the word insulin resistance because you can have someone like this 300 pounder with very, very high insulin levels who's not diabetic. And the reason for that is their liver and their fat cells are preventing them from becoming diabetic by clearing the sugar from their bloodstream. It is only when the liver and the fat cells fail to be able to convert all of their excess sugar into fat that their blood sugar starts to rise. And that's related to insulin resistance. And so some people's blood sugar rises early because they can't clear that sugar very early. They're not very heavy, but they're as insulin resistant as the other group. They go on to, to damage their red blood cells, which we call type 2 diabetes. But the process is identical whether you're obesogenic or diabetogenic. And I think the this metabolic textbook is going to do a very good job of helping to define those two groups. You may say, okay, someone looks like me. Oh, they're very healthy. Well, I've lost 105 pounds. I've lost about 50 kilos, just under 50 kilos. I'm obesogenic. But if someone's my size and this is their top weight and they, they eat like I used to, they're probably diabetic without being necessarily over obese. And quite frankly, um, more of the kids are in trouble when they're mildly overweight rather than the 300 pounder. Everyone looks at the 300 pound morbidly obese person and says, oh my God, they're so sick. I'm more concerned about that child with a BMI in the 18 to 22 range when it should be in the 12 to 14 range, who is now starting to become diabetic. Um, that's more of a concern for me than that enormous kid. Um, you know, I, I just want to bring the point um, to everybody's listening that the body is attempting homeostasis and it attempts homeostasis, like what you've both said, for a long period of time, trying to process this excess um, carbohydrate and calorie intake and the um, uh, the, the, the reactive oxygen species that are being generated from the seed oils, um, you know, all of, all of the, 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 these processes are in place to achieve homeostasis. And the way I describe to my patients is that the body is giving you time to make the change. But what has happened as modern society is that we've pushed the, the norm of BMI like you said, Rob, a little bit over. So what we accept as a, a size of our meal, what we would have accepted the number of meals a day, it's changed. The number of meals has changed. The size of meals has changed. The pant size has changed. The idea of what you should look like, the, 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 the belief that you should gain weight as you age is absolutely unnatural if you compare it to the animal world. Um, so... What I wanted to talk about. Uh, can I just, can I just make one statement, to see about because I think we've talked a lot. There is one sentence that defines everything. And Prof Noakes taught me this just last, in fact, beginning of this year, I was sitting with him and he said this one fact, the human body has a primary obligation to clear excess blood, excess sugar, where it's in the gut, where it's in the bloodstream, anywhere. And all of that homeostasis is geared toward protecting the body from excess sugar in that space. And once you understand that concept, everything else falls into place, all the physiology, everything else. But the human body, whether you're an athlete or an obese person or a diabetic, has a primary obligation to clear sugar. Thanks, Rob. So, you know, I'm I want to I want to ask Mark to talk about the complications about what happens. But what we've got is a situation where you've got insulin, you've got carbohydrates, you push the carbohydrates up, your insulin goes up. Obviously, it's a lot more technical and complicated than this. You push the carbohydrates. Your, in order to bring that sugar down, your insulin goes up. You push the carbohydrates. Your insulin goes up. The sugar comes down until you reach a point where that can no longer happen. So that's a super simplified version. So we've got two things we're talking about. Another one being inflammation, the third one. Let's just talk about these two things. Hyperinsulinemia, firstly. So Mark, why 
for somebody who has no idea what insulin is, just basically, can you explain to us why is hyperinsulinemia something that we want to avoid? Yeah, I think Gerald Raven explained this elegantly in the 80s, and I know he's referenced multiple times in the textbook. So I think he published a thousand papers. So one of his earlier papers in, in nine, I think it was 1982, you know, so, so if you look at the complications of someone with type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, for, but which would be probably a, a little bit different because they end up using more and more insulin later in life as they become insulin resistant. They're, it's called double diabetes. They start to look more like a type 2. So we have the complications of hyperglycemia, which are the classic ones we learn about in medical school. So the high glucose causes the small, the microvascular. So if I'm a medical student now and I'm seeing a diabetes patient, you know, we want to make sure their eyes are screened for small vessel disease and their kidneys. And the neuropathy kind of travels with that. So they're the hyperglycemic complications from the glycation. But then there's the whole branch of the hyperinsulinemia complications, which Raven explained so elegantly. So we had kind of a chart of the uh, glycation uh, effects. I mean, diabetes affects every cell in your body, you know, from some combination of those two forces or, or toxins when they're above normal levels. So the high insulin state is very inflammatory to the blood vessel. So the large blood vessel disease um, will come more from that. So the cardiovascular disease is highly associated with this hyperinsulinemia. And we know clinically that so many patients will have their first heart attack when they're quote pre-diabetic or have metabolic syndrome. And in the women's health study, not even fully diabetic, the pre-diabetics had a six X risk of cardiovascular disease over the course of about 20 years. And that was 28,000 women where smoking was about 3.8 times risk, full diabetes, 11 times risk. So it's like, whoa, LDL was like 1.2. So just to put that problem in, in, in reference, but also that hyperinsulinemia causes all these other clinical things we see. So I'm working with a younger population now at a veterans hospital. Most of them are in their 30s and 40s. So they have sleep apnea, they have obesity, they have fatty liver, they have hypertension. You know, so all these other, they have high triglyceride levels. So all these other changes that travel with insulin resistance are more due to the high insulin than the glucose, but together they're both bad. So, so fix it early, get the insulin down before your, your glucose is gonna be a lagging marker. So by the time we wait till people are hyperglycemic, you know, and I'm waiting, you know, I've seen, I, it's probably been about 12 years uh, since I started to understand uh, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So, you know, 15 years ago, if you were to talk to me in a clinic visit and you were overweight, of course, I would tell you to eat less and exercise more you know, and cut the fat, like that's what we all learned. And then, you know, went through my own transformation. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, a lot of reading before you, you kind of come out and you, you have the guts to go into your medical institution and talk about this because it's not well accepted. So that was, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, started talking about this with people, but I have yet, you know, in thousands of patients I've seen in the last 10 years who have metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, I'm, I'm waiting for one to be able to explain to me what's going on with them. Do you know you have insulin resistance? Are you aware you're pre-diabetic? Are you aware you have metabolic syndrome? And you kind of shut up and let them talk and they're like, uh, no. Um, well, let me explain that. Well, you do. What's that mean to you? What's insulin resistance, pre-diabetes? What's that mean? For one, they're not even aware they have it. So if you're not aware you have it, you're not going to do anything about it. And even if they are, well, yeah, someone told me I was pre-diabetic. Well, what, why are you pre-diabetic? You know, what, what does that mean? And none of them can explain it. You know, so back to, you know, one of Robert's points we were talking about before we got on the Facebook Live, you know, patients need to be empowered and educated about what's going on under the hood. And certainly, you know, the medication chapter makes the case. So, so the medications do not reverse insulin resistance. You know, manage some of the, the symptomatology, but they do not fix the root cause of the insulin resistance. So the more medications people are on for their diabetes, actually, the sooner they die. And we know that in the literature, right? So even if their sugars get a little better, because, you know, multiple other mechanisms are occurring when we're cranking up the medications, especially the insulins, you know, so if people need more and more insulin. 
Before we get to the medication, I just want to focus on insulin resistance again, because my part of the, um, I wrote the section on metabolic syndrome um, and thyroid. Um, and what you mentioned there is metabolic syndrome. Now, when you're training and you're taught the metabolic syndrome, it's the sort of vague, yes, you know that it has all these, um, you know, increased waist circumference and diabetes and hypertension and abnormal lipids. But you don't look at a person and see metabolic syndrome. Yes, of course, we as clinicians can spot the metabolic syndrome. But what does it mean to a person once they're diagnosed with metabolic syndrome? What does it mean to the clinician when somebody's been diagnosed? Well, well, with metabolic right syndrome? now, it means absolutely nothing because absolutely. it's. Absolutely. But more importantly, so of course, we know that your risk of atherogenic complications, your risk of all-cause mortality goes up, you know, two to five-fold. We also know, and this textbook clearly shows it um, with scientific detail, that the root cause of each of these um, parts of the whole metabolic syndrome, the root cause is insulin resistance. And so what do we do as clinicians is that somebody comes in with hypertension, and the modern day clinician is still taught to add a pill. Somebody comes in with diabetes, they get one or two or three pills. Somebody comes in with obesity and they're, they, they, they ask, what pill can I take to reduce my weight? And we were talking about Ozempic. And, um, you know, so I want to bring, I just wanted to, 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 highlight that this is some this is the reason why this textbook is so important because we're chasing our tails we need to be aware of the cost to the patient the patient's own life the cost to the patient's family the economic cost to the patient the e the, the cost to the economy and we're going down the wrong route of prescribing uh medication so mark tell us about uh, you talk about um, the tools for education. Um, you talk about uh, adapting medication. Of course, the first step is to start with nutrition-based therapy, but you, you are presented, and I think it is whether people agree with TCR or not, it is the responsibility of every single clinician because more and more and more of your patients are going to be presenting on a ketogenic diet. It is our responsibility as clinicians to, to learn and to know how to safely de-prescribe um, and you know, the, 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 the safety of the medications that they're on um, you know, and how to handle a patient who is on TCR with medication. So can you talk to us about that uh, briefly, please, Mark? Yeah, so back to just your thought about the metabolic syndrome, I think we definitely need to change the name of this to the, you know, high insulin syndrome or the carbohydrate intolerance syndrome. And then maybe the patient, if not the doctor will be, well, I have carbohydrate intolerance syndrome. You know, maybe what, what's the, maybe I should get rid of carbohydrates. <laughs> so the first step, you know, with the medication reduction, I just pulled off my shelf. So this is a little book I wrote. It's called Low Carb for Any Budget. It's about a 50-page guide with recipes, but it explains in very basic, simple terms the insulin resistance syndrome, how to start a low-carb diet, you know, the first week, which sucks for a lot of people, and on and on. But it actually, one of the pages on here, you know, so we want to, because a lot of the doctors aren't aware of the medication. So, you know, on uh, this page here, you know, so I have warnings about three times in here. If you are on these medications and you are thinking of starting a low carb diet, you must immediately reduce these meds, stop these meds and talk to your doctor because the doctors might not be aware that the patient's even trying a low carb diet. They may see it on the internet or their friend is doing a low carb diet who's not on insulin or not on glipizide. And then they say, oh, I want to do that, but they haven't they haven't looked at their meds, you know, so we clearly put the medications into the safe category, the caution category, and the clearly unsafe category, you know, so it's, it's kind of common sense for anyone out there using these meds. An unsafe medicine is a medicine that makes your body produce more insulin, you know, that would be a shot of insulin or these medicines called sulfonylureas because, you know, that insulin treats the carbohydrates. And if you immediately stop the carbohydrates, 
you know, day one, those meds are off. And the patients are kind of shocked because I, I have on my phone, I, I, tr I track a lot of people with CGMs. And I saw a gentleman the other day, he was on 90 to 100 units of insulin. He was very skeptical. And I said, just try this. He was uh, using like 30, three times a day with his meals. I said, okay, I want you to use no more than five. But he had a CGM on, so that's good. So like if it would alert if, if he was going way high. And uh, following him on the phone, I called him the next day. His sugars looked almost perfect in one day. And I said, well, you know, what what you do? Did you actually go to five? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's, I, I went. So he went from like 90 to 100 units of insulin a day to 15 and had beautiful blood sugars. So in so one day, one day, I mean, that's not all that's one day, but he became, you can't unsee that. So he knows this works. Now he just has to keep doing it. Yeah, so he knows it works, right? So you cannot unsee that. He's like, wow, no one ever told me that. Um, and so it starts really with the patient education, but I have medical students with me all the time. And, you know, so I think, you know, people who are established in their practice, I think it's harder to get people to change their way of practice because they've mm -hmm. always been trained. Well, you know, their insulin resistance, they're hyperinsulinemic let's just give more insulin to overcome the resistance. You know, you wrote the chapter on thyroid. If you were hyperthyroid, would I just give you more thyroid? That doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> but that's kind of what we do with diabetes. They're insulin resistant. They're already making too much. So we just keep dialing more and more. And then with, I think the patients understand this sometimes even more than the doctors, because they're just coming at it. You know, I, I interview people and I get a clipboard and I draw things and open-ended questions. Well, if you're making too much insulin and it's causing your sleep apnea or high blood pressure, your fatty liver, and they have it all, what do we need to do with insulin? And they kind of think, well, make it lower. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, yeah, make it lower, right? So let's go to what you eat. You, you eat fat, protein, and carbs, right? So we eat food. Out of those three things, which of those raise glucose, which needs the insulin? And they think about it. And 100%, they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll pause because they, it's the obvious answer, but they think that, no, it can't be that obvious, right? The carbs? And I'm like, yes! <laughs> so what do you need to get rid of? The carb. And so, like, you start this just open conversation, but you, you, ha you can't talk and lecture to patients because they retain about 10%. So you have to ask them questions that they give you the answer. Because then at least you know, if, if they gave me the correct answer, I know they know it. If I just told them, sat and lectured them for a 40 minute visit, they're gonna leave, I'll, I have no idea what they know. So, but the other really important thing about the meds, so it's very dynamic and in, in that's why we wanna treat this early. If someone is just on metformin, that's a very, that's a safe med. It's very low risk. You know, very low risk medicine. They're not gonna get hypoglycemia. So, so that patient, we don't need to, you know, be CGMs and things. I mean, it's very helpful, but they're not at any immediate risk when they start a low carb diet. You know, they're not at immediate risk of hypoglycemia. So that's kind of a safer patient. But the ones who are on, you know, the high dose insulin sulfonylureas that we're immediately, you know, cutting those meds, they need to have immediate access to us in some mm -hmm. way. You know, so they have my email, they have my text, because I need to know what's going on with them. You know, some clinics engage health coaches like the Verda Health Model, who's doing this on a big scale, right? You know, they're all platform, but they have health coaches and dashboards. So they're seeing real time. All but Mark, what's important, sorry to cut in there, is that people who are listening understand that we spoke about homeostasis and how we have this journey that the patient goes through where the person is getting more and more sick. And if you don't institute the correct nutrition at the right time, the person is then getting drug after drug after drug. So you're getting, uh, you are um, evading homeostasis or you are getting closer to the end point. You are overcoming the mechanisms that your body has put in place to keep those numbers down. And so if your glucose is out of the homeostatic range, it's attacking the blood vessels, it's causing oxidation in all of, and we've got blood vessels everywhere. So every organ that has blood vessels, especially the tiny ones are going to be affected. So the issue, as Rob said, when it comes to NASH, 
hepatitis, when you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you still have time before you reach the hepatitis and the fibrosis, and there's nothing much you can do then. Similarly, with diabetes, you know, you still have time if there's no target organ damage. So you don't have the nephropathy and the retinopathy and, you know, all the gastroparesis, there is still the ability to pull that patient back. So I want to start at that point and say for both of you, these patients, we see patients that are not so sick and we see patients that are very, very sick. Very few people understand that adiposity Obesity is an endocrine disease, that the adipose tissue is itself secreting adipokines that is aiding and abetting this inflammation. So when we get these very sick patients on a lot of medication, can you just, both of you, um, maybe Mark, since you're talking already, who is the sickest patient that you've seen and have been successfully able to pull back to either prevent worsening of illness or getting them off most or all of their medication? Yeah, I'm sure Robert's seen similar. I mean, I've seen multiple patients on 100, 200 units of insulin, you know, who already have, you know, end stage diseases um, of their diabetes. And yeah, they can stabilize those conditions. Sorry, my um, thing. But yeah, so they can, the sooner, and uh, David Unwin study this, the sooner they are identified, the better their chance of full diabetes remission. But I think what's important to anyone out there to understand is everyone can get better. You know, so the patients that will achieve full remission, I mean, no meds, normal blood sugar, you know, the, the earlier you catch them, the, the better odds full remission of their diabetes. Someone who's been diabetic 20, 30 years, you know, on high dose insulin, we want to pull them back, but they may, you know, their beta cells may already be compromised. Their beta cells may have already, you know, already failing. So those folks may still need a little bit of basal insulin. They may not achieve a full remission, but everyone, I've never met a single patient who can't get better, right? Just like if you're out of shape, you can get more fit. I've never met any single human who can't get more fit than they were mm -hmm if they start moving again. So yes, I give people hope, you know, you can get better one day at a time. You know, when they're so far into diabetes, the thought of like being off of all their medicines, that's not real to them. You know, they're like, no, that's just magical thinking. So we take it one step at a time. Oh, wow, my insulin was just reduced by 90%. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> and where on earth, which medical textbook, other than this one that we're talking about and promoting, have you ever seen that being mentioned? Um, so I just want to quickly welcome Dr. Neville Wellington. He's one of our uh, co-founders of the Nutrition Network, and he is an esteemed uh, local GP here in Cape Town. He sees so many patients and gets them off uh, diabetes medication or gets them a lot better than they were. Um, he um, has founded and runs the Center for Diabetes and Endocrinology with a diabetic educator. Um, and so Neville, we welcome, I know you've been struggling to hook on, so thank you so much. Neville's on leave and joining us. Well, we, we're talking about the root cause insulin and the root cause in um, you know all of these non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, diabetes, um, and Mark has been talking about the uh, deprescription of medication. I see that Mark will have to leave us soon. Thank you so much, Mark, for all that you've shared. Um, Thank you. Uh, Good to see you again. <laughs> and uh, great. Hi, Mark. Sorry, I, I thought we were starting at five. So, Neville, what we're talking about is we're talking, we, we, Mark was talking about deep prescription um, yes. and how, you know, how sick patients are and on so many medications. And so I asked, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to Rob to just give you time to get your bearings. Uh, we're talking about no, what fine. is this patient yep. you've seen? Um, obviously, we Rob was talking about a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease progressing onto steatohepatitis, and that gets to a point where it's irreversible. Similarly, in diabetes, we have target organ damage, so we can have patients who are very sick where we cannot really reverse a lot. But still, there is a great uh, benefit of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, and the vast majority of patients are able to come off most, if not all, of their medications. So if you want to share some of your patient histories um, of patients that have been able to reduce their medication with the therapy that you put them on. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 is it sorry? Who are you directing to? Um, yeah, well, you you go. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. This is a fantastic topic, and you know, for 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 myself, many of the patients I see. I mean, many of the patients who who I see who've been on insulin for a while. Obviously, they're usually on two or three um, um, oral and medications. And usually the first step is to is, is getting them to, to start monitoring and just to, to change their diets and then to, to slowly reduce doses. So we my, my, my thing is to get them off insulin first and then slowly get them off the other medications, especially the sulfonyl ureas and, um, and, and then SGLT2s as well if, if I'm using them, if they have been on them. But... Yeah, I would say that depending how long the patients have had diabetes for and how severe the illness is, would would depend on how 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 long and how, how much reserve they've got to to get back on to get off the medication. I, I was thinking of a patient that I saw not so long ago. He's in his seventies and was on a full house of medications now down to metformin, and that included insulin. And he did that within about three months, um, and. So, and, and he was really, and he felt so much better. He came, he was, bound, I mean, when he first walked into my room, I felt that he could hardly, he could hardly walk in. He was in pain, he was, he was weak. Within the three months, he, he's, his whole life had changed. You know, every time he came, comes in now, I mean, and that's been almost a year ago, he'll tell me how wonderful life is, how he's feeling so much better, and, and life has just changed for him. And, and he said, I can't believe that, that, that nobody else was telling me about this, which is obviously a story that we all hear often you know, people often say gee this is the first time that somebody's actually explained what what we should be doing and how to actually change life stuff. and i think that's key because um mark mentioned that earlier that we give people hope so the traditional training that oh. we've all had has been once you have diabetes there's no reversal you know it's a horrible um i've even forgotten the terminology that is used it's a catastrophic disease in the traditional model oh. but in yeah. this using therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, you're able to visibly in the lifetime of, and in a very short uh, time span, see the patient improve and the patient gets better, loves life. And this is the importance um, of this textbook. And this is why this textbook needs to be the supporting text for anybody who needs to learn um, how to treat their patients with therapeutic carbohydrate restriction for the myriad of diseases uh, with hyperinsulinemia as the root cause. Um, Rob, do you want to say something about your, I mean, your, to see a patient with uh, steatohepatitis, hepatitis, those patients are really sick. Uh, you also talk in the book about body weight regulation. And I know that we can sit for hours and hours and hours because you can't stop talking about that. There's so many modalities of therapy. So, Talk a little bit about um, what what we what we mentioned. Yeah, if you don't mind, Hussein, I, I just want to come back to this. In in our practice, about sixty percent of our patients are diabetic, and we we've got a large focus. There are four principles that I work on. Number one, there are too many patients for us to manage them. We have to, as physicians, empower our patients with the correct knowledge to empower them to manage themselves, and it's not difficult especially when it comes to deprescription. When it comes to that, there are three things that I want the patients to focus on. The primary thing is nothing else matters unless you can change the consumption of high carbohydrate diets. Uh, as a foundation, your consumption of carbohydrates and perhaps snacking has to change if anything else is gonna change. The, no medication, the human body cannot cope with what you are doing to yourself by doing this. There's no ant abuse that can stop uh, you getting drunk on a bottle of whiskey. There is no medication, no therapy that can stop you. So if you don't, if you're not interested in changing your relationship with sugar and starch, don't even begin to try. Uh, accept the diseases that are going to come at you. And it's that's a branch point. Some people decide that, some people don't. Once that happens, there are two things that we then focus on. So the assumption is that patients are addressing the, their therapeutic uh, uh, carbohydrate restriction, and both Neville and I have dietitians that help the patients with that. The place where I disagree, and this is based on my clinical practice, with most people in our space treating diabetes, I don't care how much insulin you give somebody. I don't care about how much medication you use. The priority for me is to lower blood glucose first. And uh, what happens is 
in type 2 diabetes, and even in the type 1s who are eating a lot of carbohydrates, they've got insulin resistance, which means that the gradient of blood sugar to intracellular sugar is an enormous gradient, and the cells have blocked that. If you look on a, at a really obese person who does not have diabetes, they're producing a ton of insulin. If you look at someone who's marginally overweight but profoundly diabetic, they're producing very little insulin. And the goal here is to go up on the insulin or up on the medications to reduce blood sugar, to overcome that insulin resistance. Once the gradient is flat, then the body itself, the cells themselves will recruit insulin receptors. So the, the primary thing, certainly in the US we can do this, but even elsewhere, empower the patient to know what their blood sugar is. And I'm wearing a CGM right now. Um, CGMs are very, very useful, number one. Number two is if you can't use a CGM, at least know what your blood sugars are by checking your blood sugars. So empower the patient with blood glucose monitoring. And if they're coming off carbohydrates, I delay the deep prescription. I may change some of the medications, get them off SGLT2s, but um, change the medication to bring the blood sugar down. And very, very quickly, as their blood sugar comes down, they'll find that the medication they're on is too much. So you then have an algorithm. So what I do is I set a certain blood sugar level and I use that number and I work around that number. I'll then say, okay, if your number is higher, go up on this medication. If your number is lower, come down on this medication. So at first we have to go up to come down, but very quickly as they level off their blood sugars, they get better. And I think the, the key understanding is that most people target the diabetes number of 6.5. But if you look at, you were talking earlier on about metabolic damage and metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome occurs with an, between an A1C of 5.2 and upwards. In other words, 5.2 is that A1C where your average blood sugar is no longer contributing to metabolic damage to your health. So our goal is to get that A1C as low as possible by managing blood sugar as low as it can be. And we doctors have become tolerant to blood sugars at a much higher range than we should be tolerant to them. You know, in the US, if you're at a 120 or if you're at a, a 6.5 on the a 6 to a 6.5 in, in South Africa, those units are very tolerable because everybody has them, but it doesn't mean they're normal. So wrong, we, because yes. of medication, sorry to cut of in. Of course there. it is, of course it is. The problem yeah, is you don't want blood sugars to go too low. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. And but if you empower that patient, right, let's say we use a, in, in US units, uh, a blood glucose of 110 or 100, and in South Africa, that would be about a 5, 7 to a 6. We say, okay, if you're above that, go up a little bit on your insulin to bring that number down. If you're below that, go down. But in order to do that, you have to know what your blood sugar is. So the first thing to treat is the blood sugar. And then as they start to get better, we can rapidly deprescribe because now the cells are recruiting receptors. But the battleground is insulin resi resistance, which is damage or change to the insulin receptor. That's what we have to overcome. And in so doing, at normalizing that ratio, having the cell demand energy, and, and again, you talk about going lows, having that person in ketosis where they have ketones as a backup and fat as a backup fuel source or as a primary fuel source, so this is a little bit more complicated than just saying, oh, don't eat sugar and come down on your insulin, because very often they'll see their blood sugars go through the roof. Um, and the value of the GLP-1 medications, you talked about Ozempic and weight loss. It's the only drug that actually directly treats insulin resistance. It raises insulin levels, it blocks the production of sugar by the liver, and it suppresses appetite. So we're using the GLP-1s more and more as a transition off insulin, as a transition off those other medications in that diabetic or that uh, insulin-resistant population. And they work very, very effectively to hasten the reduction in blood sugar. So for me, that's an important concept. And deprescribing is less important than normalizations of the numbers. But if you empower the patient on a sliding scale, to bring down their, their medications based on their blood sugar. That's the best way to manage that patient without you having to monitor their blood sugars uh, for a thousand patients. So the other thing that we've realized at Nutrition Network is you've mentioned diabetic uh, dietitians, but we've realized that there's a, a whole lot of um, diabetic educators that need, and we at Nutrition Network, as you know, train lay people with an interest 
in coaching to become nutritional advisors to work with doctors because as you say there are simply too many patients to be able to to meet that demand um, so that's one tool that we have. I fully agree with you. And that's why this textbook is open to anyone who's uh, wanting to learn more. Education is key. We still have this very hierarchical approach to medicine where the patient comes to you and asks you what to do when in fact they're living in their body and they know, they, they know better than us um, what makes them feel worse and what makes them feel better. Um, so Rob, thank you so much. I think we've lost Neville. Um, why, in closing, why is this textbook required absolutely, urgently, as soon as possible? What is the need for this textbook and who, in your opinion, should be using it, should be buying this and reading I it? I think everybody should be, should have knowledge of this textbook. Whether you are a patient, whether you are a biohacker, whether you are in the medical space of any sort, whether you're an educator, uh, even where you're an exercise physiologist, this has tremendous value from two perspectives. Number one, it gives a lot of practical information. Number two is the reference section, because so many people are out there flapping their gums about beliefs that are unsubstantiated by the truth. Just as a little anecdote, um, Cheryl, our dietitian, is doing a series on our, on our YouTube channel where she's going back and looking at the history of some of the micronutrient dietary advice that we give to patients. How much water should you drink? How much vitamin C should you have? And it's amazing how much of that gospel is based on, on completely erroneous beliefs and that have been transformed and passed down generation to generation. The value of this textbook is as an author and as a reader, it forced us to go back to look at the origins of the information that as clinical practitioners we're talking to patients about, and very often we find, oops, it's wrong, or we made a mistake. And, and this textbook gives us the facts, gives us the history, as, and brings us up to date about what the best practices are in the current situation, and debunks so much myth about uh, the history, where politics and misrepresentation, and quite frankly, a lot of scientific lies have presented themselves. Um, and and the, the value here is you've got experts in every field that have referenced their work really, really well um, and are able to tell a story as opposed to just give an itemized list of what you have to do. So once you understand a story, which this book tells, it's basically a storytelling book about human biology, which is what I love. I mean, Tim Noakes is a physiologist, which talks about how the body works. And we've crossed over too much toward epidemiology that gives us false facts. And understanding the story is what this book does. Whether you're a layperson, whether you're a biohacker, whether you're a practicing physician or clinician, or whether you yourself are a biologic storyteller of some kind at a university or wherever, this is the truth. Thank you so much, um, Rob. I love the biologic storytelling um, that you, you reference. Um, I just want to agree with you um, as an author and editor myself that the chapters are so beautifully written, thoroughly um, referenced, um, and it's an absolute page turner. Your section, absolute page turner. Um, whether like in nine Ramadan, I'm sleep deprived and I still can't keep away from it. So thank you so much for all of your effort and all of your um hours that you have poured um, into this textbook. I know we had to edit quite a lot because you put so much work in. Um, and I think we've saved that for the second edition. Um, and thank you so much for joining us and for sharing and for all that you do for your patients. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rob Sivers. Thank you. And thank you so much. Uh, I, and this is just a platform for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you joining us. Please go out there and uh, pre-order those textbooks and let us know what you think of it. Thank you so much and see you next time. Bye-bye.